Come, gather in, settle down by the fireside, for I have a story to tell. Welcome on in, you spectacular specimens of humankind. Welcome back to Thirst and Vanity. Today, I am going to a meeting, um, and I thought I would get ready, and I would allow you to come and do the whole fashionable get ready with me thing, so that we can all sit and stare at me putting makeup on my face. And I'll tell you a story. I'll tell you about me, really. Because we've got a whole new load of new people here. A whole load of different individuals who have come here from all walks of life. And they don't really know who I am. So I thought I'd tell you about how I became the vainglorious specimen that you see before you. First things first, the foundation. And the foundation of my life. Oh, look at that cheeky little link that went in there. I've always done theatre and various different forms of performance. It's just always been a part of my life. However, this specific journey, so to speak, uh, started actually with modeling. I was a uh, an alternative model. I still am a t an alternative model to a certain degree. Still do a fair amount of photo shoots and catwalks and bits and pieces. And that all started with uh, a magazine. So many, 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 many years ago, there was a magazine called Bizarre. The Bizarre Mag. And they had a whole load of different things for different alternative cultures. Uh, uh, or the subculture of the alternative. So many different elements of music and lifestyle and things from around the world. It was a fantastic magazine. However, I didn't really read it. I like, picked it up when I was around it, you know, but I didn't go out of my way to read magazines. It just wasn't really my thing. But the Bazaar magazine decided to run an event called the Bazaar Ball. And uh, the Bazaar Ball was amazing. It was absolutely sensational. I can't remember which one it was I went to. I don't think I went to the original Bizarre Ball. I think there was a couple before the one I went to. I couldn't guarantee that. I don't know how many they did in the end. But that was the first time that I'd really expressed myself. The first time that I'd really let go of any description of conformity, whether it be uh, subculture, fashion, or uh, what people expected and just decided to design an outfit. An entire outfit that was made up by me, designed by me, taken various different elements of cl different clothes and then made into what I wanted and just ran with it, you know? Just absolutely ran with it. There was no ifs, buts or maybes. It was just indulgence in fashion. But whilst I was there, I was... Uh, Fortunate enough to get myself into one of these little photo booths. They had a photographer in front of like a set that they'd made up in the venue that the Bizarre Ball was at. And myself and a friend of mine jumped on in. They had some props. We took photos and stuff. And that was like the first real photo shoot of me expressing myself, doing what it was that I wanted, as I wanted. And it was it was great. It was so refreshing it felt wonderful to be in front of the camera it felt wonderful to have that freedom of self-expression and not worry about how it was going to come across or anything now i'm not going to lie to you i've never really been a person who's concerned themselves with the thoughts of other people not since i was like a teenager however all of the fashion choices that i had made up until that point had always been within the confines of a subgenre of fashion, as it were. Just doing a little bit of highlighter because uh, I'm just going out for a meeting. I don't want to do all of the uh, the glad rags, as it were. So I'd always done it within goth, within mosher, within one of the various different subgenres of alternative. I'd never really just designed an outfit and worn it for myself, you know? And that was the first time. And it was unbelievably freeing to, to have that, like, lack of restraint. And from that, I kind of wondered, like, what I could do with it. 
whether it was possible for someone like me to become an alternative model. And I decided to run with it. And that's what I did. So I paid for the photos from that shoot. Took them all away with me. And added them to a portfolio. I'd already decided on the name Valen. Because when I was in university, I uh, had this wild idea that I was going to work backstage in theatre. And the name that I was giving my company was Valen Tech. I was going to do all the backstage, all the lighting, all the sound, all the bits and pieces. And it was like, right, I'm going to be Valen Tech. This is going to be my company. Where the name Valen came from, I'm not entirely sure. Pretty sure I was pissed at the time. But it was what it was, you know? The name had still stuck with me as a name that I really associated with, you know? Originally, I was just going to be Valen because there was a model out there that I had come across that I had absolutely adored called Perish. Uh, they know they now go by King Deville, but their name at the time was just Perish. Perish Dignum, I seem to remember. They look like this. And that was kind of a massive inspiration for me. The decadence, the hedonism, the over-the-top, outrageous fashion sense, you know? I really enjoyed the entire aesthetic that they created with its completely unbound perception of things. It felt free. It felt uncontained. And I always knew them as perish. So I was like, cool, I'll just be Valen. However, the wonderful world of modeling doesn't quite work like that. So when I signed up to a site called Model Mayhem, it was like, this is great. You're Valen. What's your surname? And I was like, oh God, I need a surname. What could it possibly be? So I spent hours and hours and hours thinking about a surname. Valen what? Valen... Uh, to the point where I actually sat down with books of old Celtic names because I have a Celtic background, my, my father's Irish, and I was sat down and I was looking up Celtic words for wolf and shadow and all of the other gothic things that people talk about in that day and age, you know? And nothing seemed to quite fit. Nothing seemed to work. And I was walking around my bedroom and looking in the this book and I looked up into a mirror and I looked myself up and down and I was like good lord Valen you're so vain that's it that's it eureka moment uh Valen vain cheeky bit of alliteration it works it rolled off the tongue and uh, that was that. That was where the name Valen Vein came from. And that's where, like, the real birth of my life, as we know it today, really began. From there, I did more and more photo shoots. I worked with uh, some amazing, amazing people across the entire country doing various different photo shoots and calendars and magazine entries and music videos and all kinds of bits and pieces, which was fantastic. And there's gone on for many, 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 many years. I signed to a couple of different agencies. I did a whole load of different bits and pieces. And then there was a fateful catwalk. I was doing a catwalk in Whitby. Now, many of you will know Whitby because of the uh, goth weekend. For those international friends, you probably know Whitby as the place where Bram Stoker based Dracula around. A very gothic place, very hilly, classic sort of seaside town here in the UK. Beautiful, beautiful place. But I was doing a catwalk there, not as part of the goth weekend, as part of a different weekend. And there was a whole load of designers that were there and a whole load of models that were there. And it was a big catwalk. It was great. It was wonderful. And we'd been told that there was going to be this lady who was going to be hosting the show. Then we were backstage and suddenly we heard this man's voice who was very subdued, very quiet, um, who just announced the first designer. And I was like, I'm sure there was meant to be a lady, a, a, a hostess, a compare extraordinaire who was hosting the entire show. What's happened? Where are, where are they? So I spoke to my agent at the time and was like, what's going on? Like, what's, what's, who's the guy? What's happening? And they were like, oh, the hostess hasn't shown. 
And I was like, so who's doing the announcements? And they were like, the DJ. And I was like, no offense to the DJ by any stretch of the imagination, but there is a very different set of skills between being a host and being a DJ. You can be a performative DJ, but when you're trying to hype things up for various different designers, when you're trying to kill time and banter with the audience and cause an atmosphere and entertain, the entire purpose of an, a host is to entertain in between doing various other things. I, I have no doubt that they were a fantastic DJ. They seemed very, very good when we started partying later on. Really enjoyed the work. Absolutely fantastic. But they weren't a host. They weren't a performer. They didn't have that element to them, you know? So I said to my agent, give me a microphone. They looked very confused at me and they were like, what? And I was like, doesn't matter what it is. Get me a microphone. I will host for you. I will host for the event. Just give get, get whoever it is that's organizing it to give me a microphone. I will get it sorted. So three minutes later, they ran back with a microphone. And I went out on stage. Three things went through my mind. One, I can't believe I've just done this. Two, oh God, there's children in the audience. And three, I really hope that I am as good as I think I am in this moment. And it turned out I was. Uh, I'm not going to deny it. It was a, a great event. We had a good laugh. There was times when I needed to kill time because backstage the designers were corseting people up and that takes absolutely forever. And I can honestly say it was very challenging because as you are probably well aware, I am a filth wizard and therefore talk about very naughty things. So when I got out on that catwalk and saw children in the audience, I was like, cool, that's 90% of my entire repertoire gone. I am not going to be able to talk about any of the weird little anecdotes of my life. I'm not going to be able to talk about any of the things that I would normally talk about with my friends and stuff like that. You know, I mean, I wouldn't be able to talk about any of the weird ass stories because there was kids in the audience. So it was a tumultuous time, but the show went ahead. There was a lot of entertainment. There was a lot of fun. Everything worked out and the organizers were very kind and bought me a bottle of spiced rum to uh, say thank you for, for stepping up and uh, jumping on that, which was really cool and really, really awesome, you know? And that's kind of where all of the hosting stuff really started. However, I've always had a bit of a problem in my life in that I've always wanted to do more. Whatever I manage to achieve, I always want to achieve the next step above that and therefore opening that door into hosting made me start thinking about other shows. Now, at that point, I'd not really seen any cabaret stuff. I'd seen the occasional sort of variety show. I knew of burlesque, but when I'd been to see burlesque shows in the past, it was like young women taking off clothes in a gentleman's club. And the only people that I that were like dressed up in suited and booted and dressed to the nines were me and my partner at the time. So my experience of burlesque was tarnished, to say the least. I'd never seen any good burlesque. I'd only seen run-of-the-mill social club, uh, lots of guys and the dancers were girls. But at that point, I was getting more and more interested in the ways that eroticism worked and sensualism, and BDSM, and kink. And then me and my friends did a bit of a road trip in the States. And I went to Las Vegas, and in Vegas, I went alone to see the Cirque du Soleil adult circus, Zumanity, which is their erotic circus. Uh, I actually went alone because... All of my friends wanted to go see some magic show, and I had no interest in going to see the magic show. Nothing against magicians, it's just I didn't want to go see this magic show. So I was like, cool, you go do that. I'm going to get suited and booted and go and do this by myself, because I want to go see the show. And it was sensational. It absolutely blew my mind that something could be so erotically charged and so performative and so beautiful and so impactful and awe inspiring that I I just I just got completely swept up with it. I was inspired that this could be a show and wondered how I could be a part of it. How could I be a part of that show? How could I be a part of any other shows? How could I do more with myself and what I wanted to do with adult entertainment, eroticism, 
cabaret, burlesque, variety shows, circus, the whole thing. The more flamboyant, the better. It was beautiful and glorious. I came home. I got back to the old hometown. I immediately started looking up aerial classes. I ended up being tutored by the burlesque dancer Roxy Royale, who was an aerial teacher at the time. I think they still are an aerial teacher in their own studio now. They've got their own stuff. But back in the day, they were just an aerial teacher. And they introduced me to a better form of burlesque, like the actual talented burlesque that I became accustomed with. I then started thinking about how I could integrate burlesque into what I already do. I could do a burlesque show and then host. I could do all that kind of stuff. And it was absolutely fantastic. It was a mind-blowing experience to then go to cabarets and then perform as part of the cabaret, doing burlesque, integrating Ariel into it. My favorite routine that I've ever done had me as a beachgoer that then gets cursed, turned into a mer person, and I had to do an entire routine in an Ariel hoop with a fishtail. It was like, it was something else, but it was absolutely fantastic. After that side of things, the other part of my life, the more kinky variety of my life, started being really explored. I would go to nights out in London to a bar called uh, Antichrist, which many of you may have heard of, which is a nightclub that goes from 7pm till 7am, and me and my friends would jump on a bus, get the bus from the hometown to London, party from 7pm through till 7am, and then get back to the bus station to get a bus home. And the whole thing was wild and such a wild experience. And just, it was just a sensational experience for me at that time. It was like seven rooms with seven different things. There was a couple's room, there was a dungeon, there was an industrial room, there was a rock room. There was just so many things going on there that again, wowed me and opened my eyes to the possibility of entertainment and club nights, which is what I love doing, you know? And that was all feeding into the more kinky side of things because you would have with cabarets you would have the eroticism you would have the tantalizing tempting nature of burlesque but you or at least at the time there was a limit to the level of kink and interactivity that was involved there there weren't many situations where you would have a cabaret show and a kink show combined and i was getting more and more into the kink side of things there was a fetish night that happened in the hometown that i ended up like collaborating with the organizers on i became their local contact and was the one that basically promoted everything and pushed it as much as i did they unfortunately ended up being uh messed about by one of the local venues and Unfortunately, that experience ended up basically having a soft close on the entire night because it was getting bigger and bigger and bigger. But people were still like people were traveling. And because of the mess up with the venue, we ended up having to cancel the night. But people had already bought train tickets, they'd already bought hotels. And it never really recovered from there. Unfortunately, we ended up going to smaller venues. And yeah, it just it just never really recovered from there, which I can understand. The whole situation with the venue was really, really bad. And they ended up basically nearly closing out. And just at the point where that was dying off, another event started in the hometown that was marketed as an industrial fetish event. I love industrial music. I love fetish. It made sense that I was going to do that. So I went along. And, to be quite honest with you, was shocked. <laughs> shocked and appalled. I ended up having a conversation with the organizer, and the organizer wanted a fetish night. But the promoter had promoted an industrial night. So we went in to this massive venue, and then off to a side room, because there wasn't enough people going for the venue to be filled. So there was no point in filling the entire venue. We went to this little side room. It was 
It was decidedly shit. It, it was. And within the conversations I had with the organizer, he was like, why don't you get involved? And at the time, there were so many other things going on in my life. I was like, I don't really want to have something extra going on. I don't know any of these people. I'm not sure it's worth doing this. I'm not sure it's worth getting involved when this has already had a terrible start. There was a lot of things that went through my mind, but I couldn't get it out of my mind. So what I ended up doing was going back to the organizer and saying, hey, look, how about instead of me running your event, I run my own event and hire your venue to do it. And that was the birth of Ken. Ken stands for Kinky Erotic Nature. It is... And it started as a fetish cabaret that turned into a nightclub and then became an erotic cabaret that turned into a nightclub. And it's just been growing and growing and growing and growing since its initial inception. So that's where, like, I really started to flourish because I would use all of my event knowledge from the theatre days when I worked in theatres and doing pop-up theatre and all that stuff and my experience with burlesque and shows that I had performed at to make my little baby. Now, in amongst that, I was still doing other shows and other performances. I was doing pantomime. I was a panto villain. In case you ever considered me to be the hero of the story, you're wrong. Uh, very much the villain of the story, you know? And so I was booked on so many tours and doing so many events that I was basically out of the house all of the time. I was always out doing something until that fateful year 2020, when everything shut down. Many of you will already be aware of what 2020 was like for entertainers. I'm sure many of you know entertainers, and if not, you probably saw some stuff about Netflix and uh, all the various different things that were going on with the pandemic and the entertainment industries, because entertainment got all of its funding cut because it's seen as a luxury, despite the fact that it is definitely necessary for people's mental health to indulge in things that entertain them, it was a luxury. Or at least in this country, it was a luxury. And for me, it was no different. I had seven tours cancelled that year. I, I was booked out for the vast majority of the year and had them all cancelled like that because everyone locked down, which is understandable, but terrifying when you're a self-employed performer. So I turned to streaming. Now, I'd already started streaming. I started in September 2018 on Twitch, because a friend of mine had turned around and said, hey, Val, you need to get on Twitch. And I was like, what the fuck is Twitch? And they explained it to me and I was like, yeah, I'm not sure. I'm not sure whether it's something that I'd be interested in. I'm far more into real life, interpersonal reactions and what have you. But I, I'm an open minded guy. I give it a go, you know. So I did. I sat down and I gave it a go. I sat there for three months, integrating myself into various different communities, learning the ways that it worked, deciding whether it was actually for me or whether it wasn't. And I realized that it was something that I could do while I wasn't on tour, because this was before the pandemic. This was September 2018. In fact, it was earlier than September. It must have been because September is when I started streaming. So it was June, July, where I started to actually look into Twitch and get into Twitch. Then in September, I decided to press the go live button. And I did it from my wardrobe because my wardrobe is so large, it takes up an entire room. So my first ever studio space was my wardrobe, which was wild and interesting. Balin? Yeah, I'd totally fuck him, but I don't know why. If I remember correctly, it wasn't long before that I'd shaved my head for charity as well. Then when the world shut down in 2020, I realized that I was pretty stuck. And if I didn't do something creative, I was going to go quite insane. So I threw everything in to streaming. I threw literally everything, every ounce of creativity, every molecule of energy, everything that I was, I threw into streaming. And it was hard. It was a steep learning curve, but it kept me going. And I can honestly say, being the person that I am and knowing how dark some of the nights got during 2020, because I was alone, my family were bubbling together because my sister had just had kids. So they were all bubbling together. All of my friends 
had their own bubbles with their own families, and I was alone. I, I had my pet lobster for company. And yeah, Jesus, it's weird thinking about it now. But that's where my content career started and then just continued. There was never any sureness about performative work after that point. The pandemic had ruined everyone's concept of what socializing was, what going out and doing stuff was, what working outside of the home was. So that's where it all happened. That's where it all continued. Then I started getting more and more into other social medias, my TikTok, Instagram, uh, doing all those bits and pieces. And now here we are on YouTube. I'm back out doing the cabaret performances now. I'm back out doing Ken again. But that is the journey that I have had so far. The journey that I have taken over the past decade or so to get to this position. Oh, this won't do. That's better. Figured I'd look a little bit like a very elegant, slightly effeminate Giles from Buffy today. And here we are doing Thurston Vanity. So that was the journey today. I've had a tumultuous time doing content creation, but then I've had a tumultuous time doing everything that I've ever done in life. And yet there's something about unreasonably nauseating levels of optimism that has made this all worthwhile, you know? Friends, thank you very much for listening to my idle ramblings as I have gone on about my existence. If you've enjoyed it, click that cheeky little like button. And if you haven't already, I would love it if you'd think about pressing that subscribe button because, you know, it helps me out. If you want to hear more about the peculiar and bizarre things that have happened in my life, let me know. I'll do more. Get ready with me's. That's what they call them, right? The, the get ready's with me's in order to tell you about more peculiar and interesting things that have happened in my existence. Because I'm not going to lie to you, I live life for the fun. I'm all about the hedonism and therefore my life has had some interesting stories to say the least, you know? So yeah, that's me from initial conception of little alternative model to where we are today with a content creation career, an events career, and a cabaret career, all running delightfully parallel to each other. Thanks very much for watching. I'll see you all next Friday. Until then, friends, as always, don't do anything I wouldn't do, because if I wouldn't do it, I'll fucking kill you. Okay?